But what's your perspective? You know, I think you have a much deeper understanding. Where is retail at? And then, you know, for the glass half full folks that we are, like, what is the outlook going into 25? Firms have confirmed that we have a, a up year coming. And I think that we're preparing ourselves for that demand um, as we look into 25. We live below the fold. We live underneath those incredible brands. What is the vision? Right? So like there's a story, but then it's like, where are you trying to go? If it's compelling enough, then you start to get people to believe in it. All right, as we dive both feet head first into the Q4, mm -hmm. Carlo, why don't you why don't you do a little introduction on a new team member that has joined Culture Studio and a topic of the conversation today that only Q4 could be, which is uh, retail. retail, retail compliance, retail process. Uh, but go ahead, take it away. Yeah, good to be back. We took a few weeks off there to get another episode, but we're kicking it off with a new one. Uh, and we're going to talk about retail. It is good timing, as you mentioned, because the holidays are right around the corner. How the hell did that happen, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Came up real quick and we're talking holiday, we're talking Christmas, we're talking about big box and retail. So it is a good time to talk about retail as complex as it is. But as Rich mentioned, we just brought on a new team member in Raphael. And Raphael is a retail expert. You know, you can go way back years, right? Years and years with some retail experience. So we definitely want to hear about that. Mm -hmm. He's joined the Culture Studio team as an SVP of retail and entertainment and knows a lot about big box. So, you know, without further ado, meet Raphael and maybe tell us a little bit about your background, man. Tell us how you got into retail and, and a little bit about your experience there. And then we'll dive into retail specific type of stuff. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Rich. It's first of all, it's been a pleasure joining the team. You guys have an amazing staff here. Um, really excited to get going on uh, what is week two here, but definitely excited to continue to forge ahead as you guys have already done so in the last 17 years. Wonderful company you've established here. So, uh, yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, uh, yeah, I came from a consumer products background, uh, largely at uh, Disney Consumer Products, uh, working on various different uh, products. Uh, working along inside the, the retail landscape, developing plans with our partners, our, um, our licensees in that sense, working with them to manufacture the goods that went out to market and the go-to-market strategies that existed through that. So um, most of that time what was spent on the licensing front and working through those deals and developing those relationships, building those retail programs, um, which was a, a strong base for me to then carry forward and Joined a few other organizations, including Hasbro for, from a toys perspective, uh, Mad Engine from a from a apparel manufacturer's perspective, and, and now joining uh, uh, Culture Studio and excited to take forward what uh, experience I have and bring it uh, to this team. Well, before we jump into like the granular part of like the process and compliance and all that stuff, just why don't you give like how is retail looking? I know retail had a hard year in 2024. Um, and maybe yeah. 2023 as well. Um, I know 2022, COVID shook it up yeah, for 2022 sure. was like retail yeah. e-com crazy. And then, and then 23 seemed like they had too much inventory 24, definitely too much inventory. Well, what's your perspective? You know, I think you have a much deeper understanding where is retail at. And then, you know, for the glass half full folks that we are like, what is the outlook going into 25? Uh, that's a very good question, Rich. I, I, I do believe we had a, a, a strong hit uh, during those COVID years. Uh, lots of uh, lots of people were uh, getting furloughed and having situations that impacted them uh, financially and economically, and then the retailers themselves as well. I think the commodity that kept on tricking forward was the consumable side of the business, but other things that weren't essential became to go further down the list. Uh, and really that we saw a little bit of a, a, um, a comeback with some entertainment being more standardized and calendars holding through for theatricals, but it still has been um, a bit of a down, a down year uh, as we've come into this year. Lots of different reasons for that, I would say, right? We, we have political reasons. We have, uh, we have uh, um, shortage issues from, you know, from all sorts of industries. 
Uh, shipping has been a massive one. Containers, getting to containers into the U.S. has been a very difficult um, for many manufacturers. But as you said, I think that the the future is looking very bright. I think going into twenty five, I see that we have uh, lots of lots of research firms have confirmed that we have a, a up year coming, and I think that we're preparing ourselves for that demand um, as we look into twenty five. I know the plans that we have here at Culture Studio are very rich going to 25. And I think that we're going to have a very fruitful year. And so is a lot of other manufacturers out there. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. 2024 has been what I call scrappy in retail. It's been pretty scrappy. Um, and being at Culture Studio and being in the middle as a manufacturer, you kind of get to see that from different license holders and different clients and everyone just getting through, getting scrappy. But what I've seen, and Richard probably can agree, now that we've been in this business for a while, I guess you can call us almost two veterans uncles. now. Yeah. Two uncles, 17 years in the <laughs> business. When there's a scrappy year or a couple scrappy years back to back, that means there's a year to come to, of growth. It's right around the corner for it. You know, you can only go so far down, and you must you must come up after that. So I'm feeling I'm feeling that already that that that's going to start taking a turn, but scrappy for sure. What on mm-hmm. what on the um. And the positive outlook, what is like the product line? Is Are you seeing lots of soft goods? Obviously, T-shirts is like the go-to category. I mean, at least for yeah. what you come to us for, you know, so, most soft goods. Um, but what are you seeing for retail and, and what is hot? Are other product lines maybe that, you know, our audience could be thinking about that they don't do often that we can kind of spark? Why don't you, you know, jump in on that? Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good question, Rich. I think that what we're seeing is the the world of uh, customization is coming into uh into to fold that's what the customer is looking for they're looking for an experience they're looking for something that is something that they could um own and have some customization as attached to that those aspects are becoming so much more important because of the years of not having um, uh, in, in a way of really expressing themselves during those COVID years, so that um, that activation, that uh, that uh, the experience at retail, that experience with a product is very much the forefront of everything. Um, and I would say that's what I think. It, despite the category, despite the industry, you really see that that's what each of the, the that's what everyone's focusing on going forward. Yeah, like I'm guessing that the retailers are trying to figure out how do they drive people back to the store? Uh, they have mm-hmm. all these stores and even, you know, um, if you, if you've been to like a, a crate and barrel, mm-hmm. you know, before, like they, they turned half of crate and barrel into a restaurant. Yeah. And I was like, the crate, that yeah. was genius. Someone was yeah. very smart to say, okay, we have all these yep. stores. We have all these plates. We have the furniture. We have all these <laughs> forks, right? Like, <laughs> why don't we, <laughs> toss up, you know, like some pastas over here or something like that. Um, So what else are they going to do is like, you know, probably the biggest question, you know, I'm, I guess like if you're an executive of a big retail with hundreds of doors, you know, how else can they drive people to come in, obviously to buy the product line, but also to have an experience. Is that customization? Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, some type of different experience like Peppa Pig? Um, or, you know, how are you going to drive people in, back into those stores during the holiday season or, you know, even more so all year? Yeah. yeah t- tell me you're a dad without saying I'm a dad. Yeah, Let's Peppa talk Pig about world. Peppa Pig. <laughs> <laughs> Mention Peppa Pig world. Uh, I'm in that same world. I, I got Peppa Pig song stuck in my head all day. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely a changing landscape. You know, from from your experience, though, Rafael, what's, what's the coolest, most interesting licensed product you've worked on in your career? Ooh, that's a, wow, that's, that's a that stands a, out, or like whether it's you're a like deep a, cut right there. Whether you're like a like a fan, you're like holy shit, I worked on, uh, you know, Spider Man or whatever. What what what's, yeah. what's what stood out to you the most? I uh, you know it, it it what I love about the brand specifically is how you could take one and really dig so far deep. So depending on the customer you're trying to go after, that how far you could peel back that onion. If you go after the specialty consumer and you you know that they're the fan for alls, so they're the ones that really know the DNA of that brand. Well, you could get as deep as you can to then develop a product that is really speaking to those ones that know that brand, uh, you know, through and through. Um, and 
there's been lots of examples of done that in my career, whether it's taking an anniversary like Snow White's um, 85th anniversary and going after a very mainstay Halo retailer like a Saks Fifth Avenue and celebrating that on the biggest scale possible on Fifth Avenue in New York and making that into windows, product, merchandise that is there for hours, if not minutes, um, and really creating that full experience so that the world could see. Uh, that is definitely more on the marketing side, but it was such a, a unique experience. Or you could take a look where you take something, uh, a brand like a Toy Story that's been around for lots of years as well, 30 plus years. And you, you find a way to reimagine that brand by a park opening uh, that we had in uh, uh, the Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood uh, Park in um, Orlando. And really uh, taking a retailer that's going to be able to tell that story the best way possible. And in that situation, that was a box lunch. And we were able to curate a very special anniversary collection that opened up with that park. Those are, that's something that when you, when you have those opportunities to really dive into the brand and really experience that and make product for the customer, it just, it, it comes to life with so much passion. And I think everyone involved in pro programs and pro product like that um, really gets the fulfillment from those situations. Yeah. Like the, you know, the, the pop-up within the store um, yeah. has, has mm -hmm. seemed to, you know, caught more and more success. And I mean, even like myself as a consumer, like, if I know that there's going to be an event at, at a certain date at a store, I will, you know, if I'm available, I will make my way there rather mm -hmm. than just going to a store for, you know, something that doesn't have like that urgency or that like event driven experience. Um, so I, I, I'm very, with you on that. Very true. Yep. Yeah. Experience is everything. Um, well, let's dive into some of the complexity because one thing I've learned and especially having you on board is that it, you know, retail is super complex from just understanding the licensing and licensor, licensee. That's a, that's a whole thing in, its, <laughs> in itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but let's talk about just like, maybe let's start with vendor compliance, you know? Yeah. I was, like, I was going to say, you know, since you've been on the other side and you, you live, you know, we hired you, right? Like we brought you on the team because like you understand the client. Um, and so that was so important mm -hmm. to us because, you know, the best way I, we believe for us to service them is to really understand them. So why don't you break down, like Carlos said, was like, what, what would you be looking for in a manufacturing partner? What does compliance mm -hmm. look like? What does product development and selection look like? Kind of take us, you know, down that whole journey. Uh, that's a, that's a really good um, point of view, especially coming from where you, are at a brand and you want that brand to come through with the right manufacturer. Um, I think the elements that one that stood out to me, even coming here, just to, just to call out was the way that your organization works. You could quickly see the, the individuals, first of all, engaging with them is a number one. I think from the day to, the day to day, that human, uh, the human capacity within that is a huge judgment as to, who do you want to go to in manufacturing your goods? The team here at Culture Studio does an amazing job. They all work so well together and they have a one vision to make the best product and deliver it fast and on time. Um, and that right there, speed of market, huge, massive, uh, massive element for, for me when I was at, when I was at any of the license, uh, licensors that were out there, um, that meant a lot to me, but it also had to deal with our complexity and able to take a, uh, take a piece of, uh, take an asset and know how to really come to provide vision versus just a logo slap. Your design team, design team here do a, does a fantastic job at, um, at applying those to products so that there's not a lot of back and forth. It, it's a, a quick review. Yes, you're on the right path, move forward. And I think that that also speaks to your speed. And then separately, I would say that there's a large part of uh, working with uh, manufacturers that understand uh, the, the international sourcing element of it and working with factories that we know that are going to be able to, to pass compliance uh, and live up to the standards of uh, the, the retailer as well as the licensor as to all the the audits that are going to be provided be behind it, all the, um, the, the safe uh, manufacturing 
um, uh, requirements that must be held through and, and all those aspects that come along with working with like major partners. Uh, that those, those are elements that you can't necessarily teach. You need to be able to have had had that experience. And then I would say the last thing uh, that really, um, that really sprung out to me with, with culture studio was the way your infrastructure is set, the tech, the, the cleanliness of your platform, those aspects are not something that most suppliers, most manufacturers have. That's aspects that I think really bring, uh, it shows the level of quality that you're already bringing, even from the technology standpoint, that then later on gets delivered through the product. All those come together into what I would feel is is all the quality um, check marks, if you will, on bringing the right type of manufacturer to come and take care of and move forward with your brand and produce that product to then ultimately fulfill. Yeah, pretty much having a good partnership, right? Having a good partner that has value that can kind of execute for you. Um, yep. Yeah, I would say like on the complexity side too, the vendor compliance, that's one thing that we call it chargebacks. You know, I guess we can talk about chart. Like we, we like to call ourselves chargeback Kings just because we understand it and we try to resolve them. But anyone that's in the retail game understands that chargebacks are a real thing. And a lot of that comes down to the vendor compliance. I don't know if anyone's seen a Spencer's or a target vendor compliance guy, but it looks like the, you know, it's a massive book the Holy Bible. trying to, yeah. Holy Bible trying to trip, <laughs> yes. trying to trip you up. Um, yeah, you have any insight on, on these vendor compliance or just the, the the difficult nature of all the steps that are needed? And it, it, is it just a revenue source for a vendor to say, hey, you put that label on the wrong side of the box, $250 per box, let's see a chargeback? I mean, they are very complex. And I think that it depends on who you're working with, uh, whether it's the Walmarts and Targets of the world or or it's the Disneys or the Warner Brothers of the world. They, they have a certain level of... Um, expectation they have with all their vendors and yeah sometimes it leads to some additional fees and uh different nuances that exist if you don't do things at a certain time and how you do it or if you're producing out of factories that are are not um approved or haven't had um recent audits all that comes into into um into consideration on all those um and you know i would say that there's a few gold standards in the industry that you want to make sure that your your vendor complied against. You Culture Studio has a fantastic record of working with some of the best um, and already being able to pass those tests and make sure that those are elements that are are well taken care of. And I think that it, it, working with a, 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 with a manufacturer like Culture Studio to um, see through that, those that know the process and understand the complexities and everything that's attached to it. It just takes a lot of attention to detail as your team is well aware of and how they handle these um, and just staying on top of it. And I, I think that, you know, the, the guides, the guides, um, there's always going to be a nuance to one or another, but I think that if you are putting the attention to it, like your team does here, you're going to, you're going to constantly stay ahead of that. And that is a very hard hill to conquer. And, you know, but culture studio does a fantastic job in doing that. I wanted to switch to two other different topics that I think that, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if these have been fleshed out yet. So maybe we could do it right here, right now, or if not, we just give somebody a really good, you know, incredible idea and they run with it and that will be even better. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about, authenticity and mm -hmm. and loyalty like so first off how are these retailers authenticating their products so if you if you look on like the grand scale you know like a hermes or a louis vuitton or mm -hmm. a gucci or even right down to like a piece of music merchandise right how do they authenticate that this is real, that this is coming from the license holder, that this is coming from, um, you know, Hermes themselves or Louis Vuitton themselves. How do they authenticate? Do you have any insight on that? I mean, there's, uh, when you talk about the Hermes and stuff, that, that is a, it's a different layer to what I'm used to, but, but understanding your, understanding where you're coming from. I, I, you know, I think it comes down to, the the actual 
the actual product that you have and necessarily saying what are aspects to that product that we could trust where it originated where what stamps stamps of uh you know authentic authentication that you could have that you could provide to that item even label it on the box if you will or the sustainability model if you you know go down that route there's a lot of different there's a lot of different ways to authenticate your product but doing so in the the ways that the consumer realizes it is the probably the most trickiest and i think that that's that's the one where you're balancing it you don't want something that is going to fade away in a few days you want something that's going to be tried and true but you also want to provide that ability to tell the consumer they're they're being uh sustainable by purchasing a good for example a sustainable tea if, if you will those those call outs uh, you know i think that it's either done by one by brand or if you don't have that brand name like the Hermes, it's done by building that in the consumer DNA of who you're going after and really trying to be able to call those things out on hang tags or um, or the marketing message that exists for those brands. It's it's a tricky it's a tricky one to do. It's a tricky it's um it's it's a it's one you have to really weigh the benefits and costs of that. But when you get it right. Those are aspects that the retailer absolutely wants, and they, they they want to have that product in their stores to call it to their consumers saying we are investing in X, and that I think is um, you know an important message when you out, when you are out at retail to have those brands that call out that. So I had a I had a conversation with a, a new startup, and we're gonna Michelle we're gonna have to put it put the the link to their tech in the show notes because unfortunately I, I just for some reason I'm blanking. Maybe it's because I went to Peppa Pig world last week, but <laughs> you know, what they're, what they're doing is they're putting little RFID chips, right? Mm. Like inside the product. Yeah. And so that, you know, you could, you could buy a pair of shoes, right? Uh, on stock X or on a reseller market. Yep. And you could go to the app and you could scan that chip. And you can authenticate that product. And so you could That's actually true. say that this was made on this day at X and X factory. And then it was originally purchased from X store by this wallet, right? Obviously not telling like, mm -hmm. you know, who the person actually is who originally bought it, but unless that was, you know, public for some reason, I don't know. And, and not only that, not only could you authenticate the product, but then I was talking about like loyalty side is that you could then go to, uh, Teddy Swim's concert, right, on November 19th. Mm -hmm. And you could enter free if you're wearing these shoes, right? Like yep. the mm -hmm. shoes are the ticket. You scan the, the, the chip in the shoe, and then that would bring up a QR code and you could walk into the stadium or something like that. It's like, so, you know, we're starting to see a mm -hmm. lot, and I believe retailers should be really jumping on this. You're starting to see experiential and product and authentication and loyalty all coming into one beautiful yeah. environment. Um, yeah. I like that. You know, it, who's going to win that? I so don't know. And then how do you scale it, right? Who's going to scale it? Who's going to yeah. win that? I don't know. That's well, I could tell you that, for example, Walmart is probably the the ones that requested that the most. The, the, the request for specific Walmart RFIDs have been... Uh, really established across all categories, whether it's toys or whether it's uh, apparel or whether it's um, uh, consumables, they want to know what is that tracking for the item, not only for the consumer to have that knowledge, but also for them to have that built within their systems and their metrics, yep. because they want to be able to say, this is the Walmart product, not the product that also has gone out to plenty of other retailers yeah. they need it for themselves but they also require it for their consumers and it's a very costly process to go through all of the the nuances that are that are attached to creating individual rfids for everything that you have mm -hmm. um but it's a process that they're requiring older vendors to or older vendors to, to take on so it's um it's one where it's the future of retail um, and it's the biggest box retailers going after each of the vendors and saying they must comply in that aspect. 
Yeah, even like on the Disney side, like could you imagine you buy something at the Disney store in Orlando, to you authenticate that product, you get the RFID, then you get the QR code, then if you visit, you know, one of the parks, yeah. right, like you get another loyalty point for that. Then if you go mm -hmm. to Disney on ice in your hometown, you get a loyalty for that. And then you get, you know, meet the character or whatever the case may be. It's like, could be like, a, you know, this whole kind of experience yeah. that, that is, is brought together. That could be really cool. All tying back to that purchase of the RFID. Yeah. The, the other, the other question I was going to um, ask you if, if, if you're seeing, and you know, I know this is something that, that we push hard, but um, oftentimes there's, there's price involved, but are we seeing domestic manufacturing? Are we seeing American made products come more into the retail scope or is retail lagging still on that side? Depends the industry, but I think the push was going to go to domestic. Um, it's just the cost. The costs sometimes don't necessarily make sense for the, the industry. Um, I, I, I feel that the movement is going back towards made in the USA. Made in the USA means a lot more than made in anywhere else. Um, and honestly, when I was coming in here, I felt very secure with the fact that Culture Studio had the capacity and b ability to fulfill all the domestic um, production, production needs. So I think it's a huge selling point that you have domestic. Um, many others don't. They, they crave, they want this. They want the ability to produce domestically to supply within two days and that speed you can't have internationally. So I would say that the the market's moving towards made in America as long as price can be met. And um and that's and that's a wide wide range when it comes to the industries. Yep. Yeah, that's the challenge, right? How do you get the overseas kind of pricing but get the domestic fast to market production? But that's good Correct. news for us. If, if we continue to go down the domestic path, that's good for all of us. And yeah, I feel like you have more control when you have, when it's closer to you, right? When you got something yeah, coming on 100%. a boat with all this stuff happening with the shipping and the ports and you don't, you, you never know what's going to happen. And yeah. you got products stuck on a ship for two months and you lose control there. Yep. Com completely. Awesome. Well, cool. this has been great. Yep. Thank you. Welcome to the team, Raphael. There'll be, uh, I'm sure, f plenty of more content that we can make uh, on the on the retail front and with Raphael. So welcome to the team. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Carlo. Thanks. Man. Appreciate it for having me on.